Veterans Day in commemoration. A special thank you to all the dignitaries for joining us as we honor our veterans. Thank you to our city and state leaders who took time to be here in honor of our most important guests, our military veterans. We welcome Senator Klobuchar, Representative Altendorf, Mayor Wilson, our city council and school board members, county commissioners, and other important local leaders who took the time to be here today. At this time, please stand with attention and respect as the All Veterans Color Guard and the Prairie Island Veterans Color Guard present our national awards. Following will be our civil air patrol presenting our military flags and our Native American Student Association presenting the flag of the Prairie Island Indian Community and the legal staff. Following will be the national anthem sung by Redding High School Nation, directed by Scott Perra. Please direct your attention to the flag here on stage.
and that may be the tallest microphone I've ever seen in my life. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful uh, to be here with the students, uh, with our veterans and their families in Red Wing, a city with a tradition of supporting our troops that goes back for more than a century. And I bet a lot of the students know this history, but during World War I, um, many of the boots that protected soldiers uh, from trench foot, a terrible condition caused by damp conditions in the trenches, were made of leather from Red, Red Wing's own SB Foot Tanning Company. And during World War II, and by the way, could I say we have three World War II veterans with us, Lou Chackett, Don Wolf, and Jay Murphy. We could give them for your service, and during World War II, as they know, uh, Red Wing Shoe Company developed the Sky Trooper boots uh, that allowed paratroopers to survive the shock of a parachute landing. Um, it goes on through Vietnam, SB Foot's tropical combat leather protected our troops uh, from jungle conditions, and today they've developed a new lightweight leather for the Defense Department. And in other words, when we talk about active duty troops being boots on the ground, we can thank the city of Red Wing that we have the boots to protect. Okay. Representative uh, Outdoor, thank you. Um, we also have, of course, Superintendent Wagner, Principal Boots, who you just saw from, um, and also Principal Bierman, who I know is a veteran himself. Uh, this is a moment when the community comes together. Every year on the 11th day of the 11th month, we pay special tribute to our heroes. And with all the uncertainty in the world today, we remain particularly grateful for those who put their lives on the line to defend our freedom. How can we truly thank those who risked their lives for us way back through time? How can we express our gratitude? The simple answer is we actually can't. We will never truly repay the debt we owe them. But what we have to remember is that it's not just on Veterans Day where we thank those that have served. I think we all know those we love who served. For me, it was my dad. He served during the Korean War. Uh, he was actually stationed in Germany where he wrote uh, leaflets. Some of our old timers will know my dad was a columnist and sports writer, covered the Vikings, wrote a book called Will the Vikings Ever Win the Super Bowl that's sadly still relevant today. Um, but back during the Korean War, um, he actually wrote leaflets to be used against communism, and he was stationed in Germany, and he always felt guilty that he didn't go to Korea like I know uh, many of our Korean vets uh, that are here today did. But he was still a proud veteran, and he's buried now at Fort Stone. Um, when he got home, my dad wrote columns, and he wrote about what he called ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I cannot think of a better way to explain what our veterans have done. In the past, yes, from those muddy, muddy fields in World War II, uh, to the jungles in Vietnam, to the deserts and desert storm, and in Afghanistan, um, and in Iraq, to what they're doing today. I was actually in Poland um, last year, um, with Senator Wicker, who's the ranking Republican on the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, um, and others, um, when Ukraine and refugees were running across the border with nothing but their backpacks, kids, little backpacks with their stuffed animals in it. 
and on the other side in Poland were our troops, our NATO troops, uh, who were part of the efforts to train the Ukrainians to repair the weapons that they've been using. Um, it has been an all-out effort. And when you see it in action, our own soldiers have seen uh, it's something that you never forget. But when our soldiers signed up to serve, there was no waiting line. And when they come home to the United States of America, there should never be a waiting line. Not for a home, and not for a job, and not for their health care. Uh, that is why we have been so focused. That's why we've been so focused on things like getting them the benefits that they need. I remember we had a soldier that came home uh, in the last few years and he lost his leg in Iraq. And the, the uh, VA, this was a true story, told him that he couldn't get his benefits because there wasn't proof that he had lost his leg. I'm like, he doesn't have a leg. Um, and we ended up having to get involved and call, and within a week we got his benefits. That's one example, but there's much bigger examples, just small things, getting back taken, getting appointments, and yes, the burn pit. One of the things that came out of Vietnam was that we realized that those who served um, who had been exposed to Agent Orange got really sick. And it took years and years and years to get them the kind of health care they deserve. We did not want these burn pits to be our generation's Agent Orange. And that is why we just passed the PACT Act with huge help from Minnesotans. A guy named Brian Muller, whose wife Amy Muller was stationed next to one of the most notorious burn pits, lost her life with pancreatic cancer in her early 30s leaving behind three beautiful children, including a baby, and brought and vowed it was never gonna happen to anyone else again. A woman named Amanda Barbosa, who stood up for her husband, who has cancer now, but is in remission, who is also stationed next to a burn pen. So what the PAC Act does is it makes it really clear, if you serve next to a burn pit and Desert Storm or in, eight or in Iraq or Afghanistan, or if you were exposed to Agent Orange, you should get the help that you need. And we finally have kept our promise to the vets. So I want to end uh, with some wisdom from someone who is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think of him every day, actually, when I'm in the Senate, and that was John McCain. Um, I was honored to travel with John all around the world. Uh, we were in the Ukrainian front line way back in 2016. Uh, we went to Asia, and we went to Vietnam, and we went to the prison, Senator Lindsey Graham and John and I, and stood right in front of that cell where John was held when he was captured um, as a member of our, of our American troops. Uh, when he was captured, his plane went down in Hanoi. And that was this little tiny cell where he was beaten, where he was tortured, and he made the decision in that cell, and I want you students to think about this. John McCain's dad was really famous. So what they were trying to do um, was allow him to be released early so it would embarrass our military. He refused to be released early, prisoner of war. He said, no, other people should be released before me. And so he stayed in that cell tortured to this to the end of his life couldn't comb his hair anymore because he couldn't his arms couldn't work couldn't get on a rain jacket and he stayed in that cell and the coolest thing about John McCain is his resiliency his humor honestly he kept going back to Vietnam to normalize relations with that country he was a hero in Vietnam when the war ended because he kept coming back to look for a missing in action yes to make sure that they got the respect they deserve, but to also do uh, normalize our trade relations with the Vietnamese. And that day when we went to that prison, we took a tour and they had a new exhibit and it was his flight suit where he had been shut down. Or at least that's what they said it was. And it was in this glass thing and it had his name embroidered. And I'm looking at the picture of him getting shot down and I'm thinking, how could that be? And I turn, he's there, there's a hundred cameras with us, and he says, very nice, he poses for pictures. And I turned to him and I said, was that your flight suit? He goes, that wasn't my flight suit. <laughs> <laughs> but out of respect, 
will say it was my flight suit. That was John McCain. Um, and at the end of his life, he got brain cancer, and I went to visit him with my husband, visit him and Cindy at their ranch in Arizona. It was only a few months before he died. He was still joking around about where this machine gun was that the Ukrainians had given us that the Navy had confiscated to the end. He's like, where's my Ukrainian machine gun? But by the end of the visit, he kind of lost energy and he couldn't talk anymore. And he said one more thing, that's all he said to me. And he took out one of his books and he pointed to a sentence in the book. And the book said, there is nothing more liberating in life than fighting for a cause larger than yourself. There's nothing more liberating in life than fighting for a cause larger than yourself. I hope all of our students here today in this wonderful city, in this wonderful high school, will talk to one of our veterans, hear about why they made the decision to serve. What was the cause that was worth fighting for them that was larger than yourself? We're living in a really hard time right now where people have to stop looking down at their phones and instead look at each other. Where they have to be willing to civilly debate differences in opinion about issues instead of sending mean tweets and mean texts. And part of your job, kids, your civic duty, um, when you go out into the world, is to carry on the tradition of these veterans. And remember that there's so much more that unites us as a country that divides us. That is my hope for us and for these dear veterans on Veterans Day. Thank you very much. Hello, my friends and relatives. I greet you with a good heart and a warm handshake. My name is Jamie Johnson. My Dakota name, Chante Washtewi, translates to good hearted woman. I come to represent the Prairie Island Indian community. We are here to respect and honor all veterans that have served in all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces that protect and defend our rights and freedoms. 
a major focus in Dakota culture is to honor and respect our veterans. During all ceremonies, speeches, and prayers, tribute is paid to those who have sacrificed for our nations. The people of our communities and battle have value and admire their wisdom, leadership, and service. American Indian communities remember their veterans' sacrifices and traditional songs. Today you'll hear the veteran song. This song demonstrates thousands of years of traditions in our culture for our Akichita, our warriors. In this song, you'll hear words like Ohitika, brave, Akisha, or Warhu, Natan, to charge, and Kiksuyu, to remember. Midaki, Miwana, Midakshi, Austin, Owen, Daku, Ochichi, Yakapi, Ga, Akichita, Odoa, Ma, Iheyak, De. Please rise and remove your caps as we sing this song. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Chiefs, Commander Graham Katie, retired from the United States Navy, an educator at Minnesota State College Southeast, a member of our local legion, and beyond the yellow ribbon team. As you enter the gymnasium this morning, you have made, you may have noticed a small table in front of us. It is set for one. This table is our way of symbolizing the fact that numbers of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are commonly called prisoners of war or missing in action. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with us this morning, and so we remember them. This table, set for one, is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his oppressors. Remember, the tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. Remember, the single red rose in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones for our comrades in arms who keep the faith awaiting their return. Remember, the yellow ribbon on the vase is reminiscent of the yellow ribbon worn upon the lapel and breast of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. Remember, the candle, the candle is lit, symbolizing the upward reach of their unconquerable spirit. Remember, a slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Remember, there is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears as they wait. Remember, the glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this morning. Remember, the chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, all of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended upon their mighty name and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you. Remember, until the day they come home, remember, remember. Veterans and service members, feel, feel free to stand and salute as we play taps. Thank you, Commander Katie and musicians. Today, it is our privilege to say thank you to all of America's veterans, to let them know what we appreciate them for their service and honor them for their sacrifices. The price of freedom is high. We cannot afford to forget those who have paid and, of course, those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. Today, as we honor the men and women of the armed forces, both past and present, 
I want you to look around these brave Americans in this gym and really think about what they've done for our country and for you. We'd like to take some time now to recognize those soldiers who have served in battle for our country. Please stand if you served during the global war on ter terrorism, including conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan.
I'd now like to ask all veterans here today to stand as you're able and be recognized one more time.
United States Navy. Despite those obstacles, I got good grades during high school, and 
I still struggled to make a plan of what to do after graduation. Now trust me, this isn't going to be a message simply encouraging you to join the military. This is just my story, the story of a local veteran, and I hope through my presence and my words that you will feel encouraged in whatever your struggle may be right here in this moment. I've attended a couple of Veterans Day programs here at Redmond High School, and the one thing I've always noticed is the students in the bleachers. And really, this program is for you students. The community could choose to honor our veterans at any venue, and the veterans would attend. I'm thankful to see so many, uh, even some from our greatest generation. But the event is held at Redmond High School on purpose for you. And so today, I'd like to direct this message to you students, our next generation. It's something you've likely heard before, and it might sound cliche, but through some of my tougher tribulations, I've made this a motto to live by. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. And this might make you think of that meme involving Bear Grylls that originated in 2017, but the saying was first made popular by a 1986 movie called Heartbreak Rich, starring Clint Eastwood, who played a uh, gunnery sergeant in the United States Marines. The phrase improvise, adapt, and overcome has actually become an unofficial mantra for the Marine Corps. I would go as far to argue that it could be the signature phrase for all military branches. During my time in the Army, whether I was deployed to Iraq or in garrison at Fort Hood, I had these three words on repeat internally, improvise, adapt, and overcome. But what does it mean? Put simply, it means to create a new way of successfully solving a problem, a journey battling difficulties in order to achieve success. Sounds like a lot like life, right? Is there anyone experiencing difficulties right now? We all are. Whether they be at home, at school, within a relationship, or at work. We all have dreams and goals. But at one time or another, roadblocks and failures will happen. Things like failing a test or a class, not being on track to graduate, or maybe you didn't get into your dream university. Improvise means to create without preparation. Now don't get hung up on the technical definition. Improvising is what we do in this journey called life. And maybe none of these situations apply to you, but it is guaranteed that change will happen. It's inevitable. You will encounter some type of conflict one day and you will need to create a solution. Are you ready? Don't let conflict slow you down. Take any situation you're in, brainstorm an idea that will move you in the right direction. It's time to adapt. As defined by Oxford Dictionary, adapt means to make something suitable for a purpose. Or how I understand it, adapt means to change, to alter your journey. You cannot continue doing the same thing and expect a different result. And so comes the proverbial fork in the road. You can stay on your same path, or you can adapt and change what you are currently doing. Will you spend more time studying or get a tutor? Apply to a community college instead. Start seeking a trade job, or talk with a military recruiter. Will you consider this bump in the road uh, your failure? However you view this direct disruption, choose your next path with optimism. This process will not be easy, and I recommend you share your struggles and ask for help. Talk with your parents or a trusted teacher, or reach out to a local community or business member. And I might be a little biased, but I would even recommend speaking to a deputy or an officer or even a local veteran. Don't let these challenges throw you off course. Take advantage of whatever resources you can find and overcome.
overcome. While I know society has its own definition of what being successful means, that doesn't mean you can't add it in what successful means to you. I grew up living in a rundown duplex, but now I own my own home. I grew up with a single parent during childhood, but now I'm raising three children with a spouse of 10 years. I had no plan after graduating high school, but I joined the Army and I wore ACUs every day. And now I wear a different colored uniform as a public safety telecommunicator sergeant at the Goodhue County Sheriff's Office. I'd say that's pretty successful. The key here is that the end result is a success. Celebrate your small victories. Move out of your comfort zone and turn your brokenness into resilience. And the way you do that is by applying this method. When Lance approached me two months ago and asked if I wanted to speak today, I hesitated. I wasn't sure I would be a good fit here, speaking to the younger generation when my childhood was less than ideal, or to the older generation who have accomplished so much more than I have. But throughout building this speech, reworking the words and the paragraphs and the thoughts, thanks to my Aunt Renee, I kept hearing a song conveniently playing on the radio called Hold On by Katie Nicole. The lyrics say, and I won't sing this part. They say, hold on just a little bit longer. I know it's gonna be okay. These days are gonna make you stronger. You'll find purpose in the pain. Taking time to reflect on my military service, I knew this was the message I needed to pass along. I hope each and every one of you can improvise, adapt, and overcome the struggles that come your way. Thank you.
I am not the tallest principal in the groups. Good morning, I am your superintendent, Dr. Martina Wagner. Um, I'm very proud of this moment of going off script just a little bit. Um, my father was a veteran of the Vietnam War. He is proudly married at Fort Stanley with your father. Um, and so in this moment, I'm very proud to be among veterans and those of you who have served for our country. For our students in this space, I want you to know, yes, we did get out of the first period. However, this is a more important learning experience for you to be among champions in the room. For those that worked with me this summer when we kicked off the school year, we talked a lot about champions. So my directors, my principals, my leaders, my staff know what I'm talking about. For students today, I would encourage you, um, like our senator and other speakers said, to talk to a veteran today to learn their story and what they've actually done for us all to be here today. So we appreciate all of you veterans that I am the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your service. Again, thank you for the musicians, the speakers, the dancers, our drumming, our Native American Student Association, both Ken C and Jamie for speaking today, among others. All of you have added so much to our program. It's very heartwarming to see so many of you, and I'm extremely proud that the Redding High School is selected for this ceremony every single year. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, who I've done a lot here sitting next to and whispering back and forth about all the wonderful things that are happening. And for uh, Representative Altendorf, who is here as well, who represents the great city of Portland. And for all of our dignitaries that are joining us today and spending some time. Most importantly, veterans, I'm going to repeat this again. Thank you so much for your service to our country. And I'd like everybody to give another hand of a round of applause. Come on. 